Bienvenidos y welcome to the Biz Bruja podcast, where reclaiming our powerful intuition, our sacred medicina, embracing our magic and healing ancestral patterns, invoke powerful creations in our own well-being, our lives, familias, community, and our businesses. Remembering that our businesses are so important at this time. I'm the creatrix of this blogcast, the Biz Bruja herself, Vanessa Codornu, a modern day bruja, fourth generation psychic medium, clinical hypnotist, energy healer, and soul biz mentor and coach. An Argentine American who started reading adults at 16, became a professional intuitive at 22, and now guides creatives, intuitives, healers, and entrepreneurs to break through fears, connect to the practical power of their intuition so they can serve the world powerfully. Hola, ¿cómo están? Bienvenidos. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here today with a beautiful, powerful um, woman, soul being that I met in March and that I've had the pleasure of working with uh, in an, an event that she just had. That's really, it was really wonderful. It was really intense. And there was such a beautiful gathering that happened in New York City. So I want to welcome Erika Priscila Sandoval. Hola, Erika Priscila. ¿Cómo estás? How are you? Muy, muy bien. It's so, so beautiful to share space with you once again. Thank you so much for having me, Vanessa. I'm so happy to have you here. I was thrilled to be on your podcast. And before we get in deeper, because I think that Erika Priscila and I could be talking a lot, as you know, I like to bring people on that we could be talking for days because there's something to talk about, because we've lived life, we have something to say, and we want to connect with you. And so let me read a part of her bio, because there's a lot to her, there's a lot to her bio, but I'm just going to read some of the main parts, and I'm going to dive deep into the questions in conversation with Erika Priscila. Erika Priscila Sandoval is an award-winning mental health practitioner, speaker, spiritual healer, podcaster, advocate, and four-time published author of Latinx and Latine in Social Work, available in both English and Spanish. She is the founder and CEO of Sandoval Psychotherapy Consultation, known as Sandoval Collab, where she oversees a team of social workers with love and compassion as they support individuals in therapy and lead diversity, equity, and inclusion work for nonprofit organizations, universities, healthcare facilities, and corporations. Erika is also trained in ketamine-assisted therapy, which is a holistic breakthrough approach to an awakened mind and healing trauma and depression. Erika presented for the Trauma Research Foundation and has been trained at the Ketamine Training Center by Dr. Ron Siegel, Dr. Phil Wolfson, Bessel van der Kolk, um, MD, and Leisha, Leisha Sky, co-founder and CEO of the Trauma Research Foundation. Erika Priscila is a regular contributor to the media outlets like Univision, BronxNet, and iWestchester Radio. Now, before we came on, <clears throat> before we came on and started recording, you asked me to pronounce Erika Priscila. And I want to talk about it because I think a lot of us are going through this, right? And I was saying to you, well, that's why I'm like Vanessa Golornu, right? So what has inspired you to reclaim? And I want to hear a little more about that story, you know, if you don't mind that we begin there. So we were, since we were just talking about it. No, absolutely. Thanks so much for bringing that up. When I was younger, I was born and my mother and father named me Erika with a K, Priscila. And in um, the Ecuadorian culture, maybe some other cultures, we usually use our middle name, Priscila, instead of the first. So I was called Priscila for most of my childhood and adolescent life. At 14, going into high school, I decided I no longer want to be Priscila. I'm going to reclaim my first name, Erica. And I changed it to not Erika, but Erica. And there was a part of me that really felt like I needed to assimilate to the New York City culture because I was born in Ecuador, in Quito, Ecuador. And then I came to the United States and lived in Astoria, Queens in New York. And so there was like this, this, this feeling that I just felt like I needed to fit in and I needed to move away from my roots. And it was very painful because I remembered how I did that now at 50 years old. And I said, well, you know what? About two years ago, when I started really digging deep in 2020 about 
how I assimilated a lot to um, white culture and the community, I started thinking about all the things that I did and I had dropped my name, Priscilla, Priscilla. And I said, well, I'm bringing that back because I really feel like that little girl, like Priscilla, but in, in a more powerful state of being as a woman, as, as, a, as a person that wants to reclaim and go back to her, her roots and not lose any of that. I even changed the K, which is Erika, to a C. That's how deep it was. And I didn't realize that. I didn't even process it until later on in my life. I'm like, that was a part of me assimilating. And so I know many of us do these things. I know, and I, I decided I'm not shaming myself for it. I'm going to forgive myself. I'm going to honor myself. I'm going to honor those paths, that journey that was mine. And, and I'm so proud to share this story because I know many of us do this and it's okay. And, but what's really powerful is that I'm acknowledging I'm accountable to me and I'm now sharing the story because it's not just my story. It's so many of us. It's a story that we just choose to kind of assimilate and move away from our roots and, and, and our identity markers. And that was one of my identity markers, having the K, Erika, and being Priscilla. So I love now saying, well, my name is Erika Priscilla. <laughs> and so they're like, wait, okay, I've known you as Priscilla, it's Erika, which one is? I'm like, you could call me both, but just know that those are part of my um, identity markers and it's part of my roots. And I love sharing that story. I love that. Thank you. I knew. I I know. I was like, okay, I'm going to just bring it on her because we just talked about that. But like, that's something that, especially we're talking about, it was over 30 years ago when you did this. Like when we talk about 35 years ago, when we were our, you know, the teens of 35 years ago, it, it wasn't as accepted. It wasn't as cool as it is now to have a Spanish sounding name, to rock our accents and rock our identity fully. I know I never gave up my Espanol. I read it, I write it. Um, but some of my siblings at one point didn't really until they moved to Miami, then that's a whole other story from New York to Miami, but I stayed in New York and I, I can share like my dad's name was Guillermo Colornew. And then he became Bill Cordenew. Mm. Putting an R almost like just in the pronunciation, throwing it in the front because people couldn't be like William Colornew, like Codornew. What is that? And so that's why I've been reclaiming for the last few years when I said um, because I like it more. That's, and I, by the way, I don't know if you did this, but I spoke Spanish in the home. Did anybody speak English in your home? Cause like we didn't speak English in the home. No, I spoke Spanish in the home. I grew up speaking Spanish with my abuelita, right. with my mother, my dad, my uncles, complete Spanish in the home. We still speak Spanish in the home. Exactly. I only speak English yeah. with my sisters, my younger sisters now. Exactamente, right. I know one of the things that when my mom passed, it was hard because I used to speak with her like three times a day in Spanish, right? And so that's been a little difficult because it was like also the home language. Mm -hmm. And even understanding that Spanish is a colonizer language, but it's still part of our history, right? It's part of the language that we access, part of our ancestral language. I love that we talked about this and you were open about discussing it. So you're you're from Quito, Ecuador. When did you come here and did you always know that you wanted to help people? How did you become a social worker? Oh, I love this question. So I came here when I was about four years old. My grandmother, mi abuelita, came first. Long story, but in a short version, um, she was a widow. My abuelito had died when um, I was one and it was in a car accident and I was in the car with him and my life was saved. And my grandmother came here to start anew, and then my mother and I followed. So it was the three of us for many years. And what made me lean into the healing practice world was they were always both incredible people that supported communities and individuals. Because even though they were going through their own traumas, my grandmother's doors and my mother's doors always opened for everyone that was migrating from Ecuador that needed a space to stay, needed resources, needed to connect and build and launch themselves to just get all the ADLs, like the, the, the things you need to survive, you know, a place to live, some food, a job. And that's what my grandmother and my mother did. So I grew up experiencing all of that. And fast forward in my 30s, because I started school later on in life um, when my daughter was one, in my 30s, I was waiting tables and my mother had asked me, you know, 
can you do me a favor? Can you translate for me again? And I always had some problems translating for it. Like I would get triggered. It would just trigger me so much. I really wanted her to like learn English, become independent and empower herself. And I said, sure. And it was on a call with a HR rep at hospital for special surgery. And she, she was telling me, she's like, oh, I just want to tell your mother that I'm so sorry that we love her. She's amazing. But if she knew just a little bit more English, we would love to have her. And that was breaking my heart because I had to translate that. And I was, I breathed in and I still remember that day. I remember where I was. I was in the van. I was in the white van with my mom and we were on the phone. It was on the speaker and I was talking to my mom and I was translating and I had so much compassion and love. And, and even though I was feeling a lot of feelings about it, there was a lot of love and compassion. And then Joanne, the HR rep said, and you, you speak so well. And and what do you do? And I said, I'm a waitress at Rosa Mexicana. She's like, did you graduate from college? I'm like, I did. She goes, what degree? And I told her clinical adolescent psychology. Fast forward, she said, you know what? There's a position at the hospital. And I'm wondering if you'd be interested in applying. We need a bilingual coordinator for a program, Charlie the Lupus. And I said, my mom was looking at me like, you better say yes. Because I was thinking, no, I wanted to work in a school as a guidance counselor and have my summers off. Like I had this whole other vision of what I wanted to do. I went in for the interview and I got the offer before I even got home. And my mother always said that day was not for me, it was for you. Because that was the beginning of social work finding me. Because then I started working with beautiful communities that needed healing and coping skills for that were impacted with uh, the chronic condition lupus. And I was surrounded by social workers and I was called into that profession. It just naturally, the doors just kept opening, opening. So I didn't choose social work. Social work chose me. And then mm-hmm. fast forward, here I am with my own private practice and doing macro work, helping community, but also helping individuals and groups and it's, it's just my calling. This is what I just, I feel like the doors just open and just held me in and and helped me move towards this incredible profession, which I don't see as a career or a job. I just see it as my calling to support people and communities to heal and grow and evolve and, and break those cycles of intergenerational trauma. I love that. I love how you said that you didn't choose it. It chose you. And the thing is we have to be open to it, right? We have to be open to it because at first you were like, I don't really want want to do this, but you were open to it. I love it. Now, you just said Rosa Mexicana. Was it on like near Northern Boulevard? No, Rosa Mexicana was right across the street from Lincoln Center on 62nd and Columbus. I was there for about seven years. Okay, 67 in Columbus. I know Rosa Mexicana there too. You were there. Were you there like 20 something years ago? Yeah. Oh, well, yes. My daughter was two. So yes, I was there 20, like about 20 something years ago. Yeah. So 20 something years ago, I worked as a hostess. I forget. It was like the first organic restaurant. I forget the name. I don't know what it's called. Juliet's. Oh, is it right down the street? I think. Right. Um, like, yeah. I know that I, I was like, is it something in Northern Boulevard? Is it Manhattan? Where is it? Yeah. So I worked there as a hostess while I was working in casting and film. Whenever a film ended, I would be going back to the full-time hostess. And then I'd go, okay, we've crossed paths. We've Probably. walked with each other. We've eaten, I've eaten there. You've eaten something. Okay. I just wanted to say that <laughs> among all the beautiful, amazing spiritual things and you being guided in Espiritu to be in your calling, also the tangible everyday things that we're sitting here right now, but somehow we were like crossing paths mm-hmm. back in the day. And when you went back to school as an older student, was it, I mean, you already had a child, like, what was it like for you? Because I imagine there's a lot of us out there and maybe people thinking about it, thinking I can't do it. So I think that maybe sharing a bit of your story could also inspire folks who are mm, thinking about it too. It was um, absolutely empowering. I failed school many times in my earlier age, like at 19, I couldn't even get it together to go to school. I didn't afford to get to college. I couldn't afford the bus fare. I couldn't pay attention. I could not do the work. I I was unable to do all the things I needed to do to even really kind of dive into it. 
And I realized that it was trauma that was holding me back. It was all these layers of trauma. And so fast forward, my daughter is born. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And so at this point, I said, okay, I need to work on myself. I need to work on those parts of me that need to heal so I can provide for her. And so I decided to go back to school to support my daughter in a different way. One, Baruch was amazing. So I went to community college first. So I graduated from there on the dean's list. And when I didn't have any um, any daycare opportunities, someone said to me, do you know that some CUNY programs have daycare for um, kids under four? And I said, no. So Baruch was one of them. And I said, well, I'm going to apply there. And if I get in there, my daughter will be in school with me and I'm going to start. So I would drop her off and then go to class. So if I knew I was separating for her and I was putting this work I started going into therapy, working with other women that were single moms and support groups. And I started really kind of making sure that I was tapping into all those parts of me that held me back before. And it just became more and more seamless because there was another purpose. It wasn't just about me anymore. It was about her. It was about us. It was about us changing that stereotype of, you know, immigrant woman, having a child, being divorced not having a degree and taken from the government. It's like all these stereotypes. I was already checking all those boxes and there's no shame in that. There's no shame because we need, when we need resources, we need resources. And so I really used all those resources, but I really wanted to utilize the resources and also provide for myself and my daughter um, in in a more deeper way in order to break those cycles of poverty. And that just kept me going, kept me going. So anytime I was in the classroom and I saw other people that were younger than me, that um, looked different from me, I just kept thinking, oh, I'm just so glad and grateful that I'm here, that I was strong enough, that I didn't have my ego get in the way of saying, well, I'm too old. What are they going to think of me? And I just became like part of that, that system. And sometimes like, no, other students were coming to me for just like guidance, just because I had this maternal way. But at the same time, I felt really good. It felt like very empowering when I graduated. (laughs) This is funny. When I graduated, they said, can all the mothers please stand up in the audience? And this was Baruch. And my dad came to the graduation. A guy I was dating at the time came to the graduation and my grandmother. My mother was in Ecuador. So when they said, can all the mothers please stand up? They were talking to the mothers in the audience. I stood up (laughs) in in the middle of all the graduates. And I thought they were talking to all the mothers that went to the school. So I stood up. And when I was watching, then there were other graduates that stood up too, because then they thought, oh, it's the mothers. And then I just saw so many of us that were mothers that were in school. And I was just bawling. I was like, oh my God, this is like a moment of just healing and just owning and saying, we could do this with, with all these barriers, we could do this if we set our mind to it. So it was actually really empowering and I don't regret it. I don't regret anything. Oh my God. I love it. I was just envisioning that in my mind and you standing up, but then everybody having the permission to also stand up and like really be seen and that there's no right time to get education, to get an education. There's no right time. It's the time when the door opens and you can walk through it. Like you said, you weren't doing well in school before because of trauma. And somehow it clicked and you graduated on the dean's list. And that's the message that I also want to share to anybody who's listening out there who's thinking about going back to school, who is a single mom, who has kids or doesn't have kids, who thinks I'm too old, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60. It's never too late. You never know what your journey is, where you're being guided. And I think that we have to trust more when certain doors open for us that we're being guided for a reason that's even bigger than us, right? It's so true. And the doors were opening. They were just more seamless and and easier. And I would just walk in, accepted it. I said, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. And the doors, when they close, that's not where you're supposed to be. And I stopped shaming myself for it. You know, I stopped thinking, I can't believe I didn't have enough money to get to Queensborough Community College. I can't believe I failed all those classes. That was in my time. And that's okay. I love that so much. I love how open you are. And there's there's so much shame put upon people over what we call failure. And maybe now we're changing, but this I think their societies become so perfectionistic 
you know, the right look, the right, how do you have a family? How does the house look? How this, they're just unrealistic standards. And when we cling to perfectionism, we don't allow ourselves to discover things. Like, you know, as you know, that I do improv, you've done acting. Anybody who's an artist, anybody who's a creator knows that you go through many different like permutations of the thing, you know, mm-hmm. to get it. And if we don't allow ourselves to go to become, we have to become. And all the becomings have different forms and different shapes. And if we don't allow ourselves to go through that process, we can't really get to that more whole part of ourselves. So I love how you're sharing your story. And your story is really inspiring and really amazing. Um, what is, so how did you decide? Because I've heard like horror stories, or not horror stories, but <laughs> Difficult, challenging stories of doing the internships, the social work and all that. Was it difficult for you? Was it, you know, was it tough? Were you like, I can't wait to get into private practice? Like, how did that go for you? (laughs) That's so funny that you asked because while I was at the hospital, I was surrounded by social workers and I kept seeing all their credentials after their name, like all the, all the letters. Right. And I'm thinking, I'm never going to get that. Like, I'm never going to do this in my mind. I was thinking that's never going to be me. And the closer and closer I became more validated by my community that I was supporting, that I was supporting them in their healing. And, 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 and I was already facilitating groups. I leaned into it and I said, I'm going to apply. And so when I applied, I applied only to one school, NYU, because that was my dream when I was much younger. And I never thought I'd get there. I'm like this little Ecuadorian immigrant going to NYU. I'm never going to afford it. I'm never going to get in. Like all these like things that we say to ourselves. And I applied and I remember kissing it, like setting it like with bendiciones and putting it in the mailbox on I was, I believe it was like 70th in York and just putting it. And I said, whatever it is, it is. And when I got the acceptance letter and, um, and all the stars were lining again, like I was getting a scholarship from here, scholarship from there. And I'm like, okay, I'm doing this. So I had the privilege of being in the advanced OIR program, which is you work full time. You do your internship additional hours at the place you work and you go to school in the evenings and on weekends. So I did that for about two and a half years and it was really hard. I mean, I had so much guilt because I wasn't seeing my daughter. My daughter was spending a lot of time with my parents and my sisters, thank God for my family because it takes a community, it truly does. They were here, but they knew that I was actually putting in the work for something bigger and I had so much guilt. But when I finally was checking off all those classes that I that I, that I completed, I would had it like really right in front of me. Like I manifested and I would highlight it as soon as one class was completed, the next one, the next one. And I just kept seeing that, that there was only two or three or four left. I was so excited and it just kept me going, kept me going. And I graduated and it was the, probably the most emotional time in my life. Um, there's a picture <laughs> that I think NYU caught of me just looking so proud, um, just away. And my grandmother was there and my, my whole family was there. And I was the first, and I was the first to graduate with my bachelor's. I was the first to graduate with my master's. And then I was the first to become a professional in, in, in the, the United States of America. And I loved the work that I did. I did a lot of amazing work in in healthcare systems and nonprofits. And in the pandemic, it was just very painful because everyone was losing their job. And I was also working at a clinic supporting um, Latinos, people that only spoke Spanish and doing one-on-one work. So I was always working like six days a week. And when the pandemic hit and I was laid off, from my nonprofit job. It was so traumatizing. And that's when I said, okay, it's time. It is time for you to start your own thing. You better take that test that will get you your clinical license, though you failed because I failed once and I never went back. I took the test. It was really hard to do that because I I had probably canceled it five times after I failed and didn't even show up for one of my exam dates and lost all the money. But my daughter, who was with me, she was 20 at the time. She was sitting at the couch. She's like, you're going to pass and you're going to study. And she was on the couch. And I didn't even realize that I had ADD or ADHD because I got diagnosed later. It was so hard to do. But when I did it and I passed it, I started building my practice. 
it became so true that this is where I needed to be because everything again kept opening up. I had so many fears that kept coming in and and preventing me from really moving into what I was called to do. And as soon as I just let go of those fears, things shifted. And now it's so beautiful as I support others that are Latinas, um, young social workers, meaning they just came into the field and now they're getting their hours. And I really want to inspire them to continue to do the same because we need more of us in this in this profession to support the mental health and well-being of our communities. And it was not easy, but it was not impossible. And it was probably something that was already in my path that I needed to do, that I was going to do. And I didn't even realize I was just walking into my purpose. Mm, I love that. And I love how you share that story. Because we need to know that, yes, some things are going to fall into our lap. Uh, Most things on this earth, right? It's a slower plane of existence, right? Spirit is fast to me anyway. Um, That we are here also to go through the steps. That means going to the class, doing the homework, figuring out why I can't focus, going to the therapy, doing the work. Earth plane is slower than spiritual plane, But there's a reason that our souls are here is because we're also here to learn that, to learn patience, consistency, dedication, devotion. And when I think of you, I I think of all those things. So um, thank you for sharing. I'm like, oh, my God, I get to know more about you. Thank you. And you know, I'm sorry, it's funny that you said that about therapy, because that's when I started going to therapy one on one. And it was expensive. But she gave me a sliding scale and she said, you know, just show up every week. I will provide a sliding scale for you. And I was in therapy through the whole time that I was in social work school and I showed up every week and I made sure that I put that money to the side for my 52 minutes and I used those 52 minutes and I don't regret it ever because that was definitely a parallel process into becoming a social worker. Thank you. Thank you for saying that for all the healers out there, for all the leaders out there, for the social workers, for all of us who are and creatives, for all of us out there, as we want to make an impact and support community, we also have to support ourselves, right? Like I always say that I wouldn't be who I am had I not gone to therapy. I think I was like 28 or something, 29, 30, around that age range and do, done an EMDR, done EFT. She was doing hypnosis back in the day. Um, like I wouldn't be who I am today because I had trauma that I had to work through that of course, we're always like shedding more and more layers and there's no shame in that. Like it was not our fault. These are things that have been passed down intergenerationally. These are experiences we've had in our lives that add to our story. The thing is that we have to feel it to heal it. We have to allow ourselves to be supported. And for immigrants, especially like I came here at a year and a half Um, but I went to school like at four, five and six back in Argentina, um, because my mom would go for a month and then she'd be like, oh, let's put her in pre-K. And then they'd let her, I don't know how, and I don't know, but there I was, you know, and then I'd come back. Um, so I've always seen the world and my work ethic is very like the old style immigrant mentality where you're like work and work and work, Mm -hmm. right? We're changing that where it's like, okay, we have work, but we also have work balance. Um, I think it's important to know that the old belief that we have to do it on ourselves and we just push through and we don't have time for that, you know, because I grew up with, we don't have time to be depressed. Yeah. We don't have time to be depressed. We got to keep going. I can't, af- I heard things like we can't afford depression. We can't afford anxiety, right? The yes. truth is that we can't afford to not pay attention to these things because they'll, they'll bite us in the booty when we least expect it. Mm -hmm. And since we're moving towards more bienestar, more wholeness, more wellness, we have to start with ourselves. So that's you shared that. Yes, so true. (laughs) And healing. So tell me about this next phase of your work, right? Because you're moving through pretty fast. I mean, you only came into private practice three years ago, it seems. Mm -hmm. Three years ago. And then you started doing all this thing, collab and this and that and hiding people and summits. And like, I mean, you've been working overtime, mi amiga. Um, and now 
the ketamine training. Tell us what is that? How does it work? And have you done it yourself? Mm -hmm. And what are the changes that you've seen? And why is it important now? So um, as I was moving into this place of launching, reinventing, just bringing people together. I love bringing people together. And we published many personal narratives of other social workers that are doing incredible work throughout the United States, Latinx, Latin A, and social work to all my beautiful co-authors. We were putting our stories of trauma and resilience on paper. It was very much more a therapeutic process for us. We didn't realize that. And as I started seeing all these traumas that I was unpacking at first, I was just kind of, you know, sharing very lightly. Then the second book, I shared a lot more and I'm like, wow, there's some deep stuff still. Cause I was, I was reading it back out loud to myself or to others. I was still pouring like my heart, parts of my body was still feeling it. And I was sitting in at a restaurant with a colleague of mine and she said, you know, have you heard of um, ketamine training? And I said, no, she goes, it's psychedelic. And she didn't even finish the sentence. I'm like, yes. And I said, when and where and how much? It's fine, I'm, I'm in. And that's how quickly I said yes. Cause I knew then that it was a yes. Cause in my thirties, I had traveled to Machu Picchu. I backpacked from Ecuador with my sister all the way to Machu Picchu. And there was something that was calling to me in Peru. It's like the Inca Trail. I wanted to sit with, with maestros. I wanted to, to work on my shadows. I didn't, I didn't really know this work. I just heard of it here and there, but I really wanted to just sit and, and work with plant medicines. And But I couldn't. It was not something that I was able to do at that moment because I had such responsibility for a four-year-old little person. And I said, no, I have to keep moving. And so when this came up, I said, yes. So I go into this training center and I know it's not plant medicine. So ketamine is not plant medicine. And, but I go in, I don't know who are the trainers. I just go in very, no expectations. And I'm sitting in this space at uh, the Menla Center in the Catskills. And it's a one week process. And while you're getting trained, you are actually also going into your own healing journey, your own journey. The first journey that I experienced was remarkable. My my ego was dissolved. It had it was like having an ego death. I was my body was still present. I knew I was still here, but it, I wasn't really here with my ego and all the self love that I was looking for for so many years through therapy through this. There was almost like a fast forward abundance love poured into me because I journeyed into places that were so beautiful and heard my abuelita's voice. And she reminded me that I was loved before I was even born and how much I was loved during my life. And, and, and it was so impactful that I, when I, when I came out of it, I was bawling. It was like, I couldn't even breathe. Like my nose was stuffy. I was just, I was just a beautiful mess. I like to say like a beautiful mess. Cause I was like, what? like, what was that? Like what? And so I was journaling a lot. And then the second journey, more things came into me and I've had some very impactful and meaningful journeys. And I would journal a lot. I was sharing with my teachers and I knew then that this was definitely a breakthrough approach because I experienced it and I kept moving forward with it. So I felt it for me and it may not be for everyone because you definitely have to be open. You have to surrender and you have to be free to just let go. And now I started working with clients that are feeling called to do this work with ketamine assisted therapy. And I'm seeing them break through patterns of ancestral traumas, generational traumas, their own behavior, the way they respond to the world, the way they react to the world. It's different because you're tapping into your soul, you're tapping into your heart work, and you're no longer really kind of living your life through your ego. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many incredible shifts in people and couples. I work with couples now, Mm -hmm. and it's been a beautiful 
journey because as they heal and as they move through their journey, I feel like I continue to heal parts of me that validates you're supposed to be here. This is the work you're supposed to be doing because it just happens so organically again. Like there's a lot of times that doors close for me that I was like, all right, no big deal. But the time that I got laid off, I questioned myself for a while. I was like, this is, I'm supposed to be a CEO at a nonprofit. This is not what's supposed to happen to me. I was going out trying to get, um, not even going out, virtual remote um, sessions with interviews and they were underpaying, under offering. I'm like, no, these doors aren't opening. So as I stepped into this, like everything was just like aligning again. So the psychedelic work has been a beautiful pathway to maybe tapping into parts of the healing journey that includes integration, talk therapy, but also this subconscious um, place of being that you're feeling safe because it's always set and setting mindset is important and the setting that you're in. So your mindset has to be okay to be there. And also the setting that you're in has to feel safe. And it's been a beautiful, a beautiful journey. And I'm just really honored to hold space for groups and individuals and couples now and collaborate with other amazing healers that are also doing this work. It's, um, I, I like to say it's, it's a medicine fest now. It's just, <laughs> you know, we're just really leaning into other parts of healing. That's not just talk therapy. I love that. Cause I think that talk therapy could take us, but us so far, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, <clears throat> and it could bring us into our head a little bit, <clears throat> depending on how it's guided. So I think that, like you said, a medicine fest. So I have a question for you. I mean, I think you've shared un poquito, like you've shared like some of it, but I want to make it even clearer, bring it up. What are some of the ancestral patterns that you feel you had to like break through to be who you are today and to do, to be the CEO of your own work, to be, to be an entrepreneur and a healer? One of the patterns that I feel I really needed to break is the fear of scarcity mentality, the fear of not having, um, there was a lot of financial trauma uh, within my lineage. It started with my, probably my, my abuelito's parents, but I just remember to the story of my abuelito. And when he, um, and this is something that I'm still working on too. He was a very successful business owner with my abuelita, but he gave so much and he would, he would allow people to take out loans and they never paid him back. So he was giving, giving, giving all this money and they were never given back. And when my grandmother became a widow, she was unable to collect these loans because a una mujer ecuatoriana in Ecuador, you, now a widow, you know, you're, you're looked at differently. And the m- little money that she had was just disappearing. The restaurant, everything like that they built was just kind of being kind of taken away. Um, she had fallen in love with another, another man later on and who was younger and he kept taking from her, taken from her. So all these things that happened to her and, and him, then my mother, of course, like felt she comes to this country and she's like, she is a guerrera, a hundred percent. She's such a business savvy woman. And she worked, 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 but didn't rest. Worked, 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 made the money as a housekeeper, working in a factory, all these different things. My grandmother was an aide. I mean, they worked so hard and they built so much back in their country. So fast forward, my mother and father were able to acquire land, build houses in Ecuador. And now they're retired there. They're, they're at peace. They're, they're good. But those money trauma and financial trauma was passed down to me. So when I became a single mom, I also did the same. And I always had this, this um, weird relationship with money. And now I don't because I've been breaking those patterns. I'm like, I'm not living in that scarcity mentality. I'm living in abundance. I'm not thinking about how much I didn't make. I'm thinking about what is opening up for me. I'm not thinking how much I gave because when I give, I get tenfold back. And I work with people that are in that same space as well and collaborate with people at that at that high frequency because we attract who we are. And 
I'm now like vibing with, with amazing, successful, beautiful beings and souls that are doing amazing things because that's what I've been stepping into and not living with like, I need to take, take, take or do, do, do. But now it's like, I'm giving, I'm releasing. I'm feeling great about it because I know that there's so much abundance in my life. And my daughter is hopefully now shifting as well. Cause as I shift, she will shift. And so these are the cycles that I feel that we've really needed to break, but it's still a work in progress. It really is. And so I know that that was one of like the major, major cycles. My sisters are now social workers as well. So there's three of us and we talk about like our, our relationship with money and how each one of us has a different, different relationship because we were around our parents at different stages of their parenthood. Yes. And our parents relate differently to each child and different stages of parenthood. I love that so much. And yeah, I think that's a huge thing from overwork to giving away to fear of loss to that there's not enough. And it's so key and important for us to work through that. What are some of the ancestral regalos, los dones, the gifts that you're leaning into? I know that my superpower is love. I know that very well. And um, I know that when my ancestors gave, they gave with love. They gave with compassion. They gave with um, not expecting things in return, but to just support and, and, and help them heal or help them grow. And when I was in Peru um, in March and I sat with um, the maestros from Shibibu in Iquitos, I, um, my, my, probably my second ceremony with, um, ayahuasca, I, I received a message within that I knew that my superpower was love. And so everything that I do, I do with love, like no matter what it is, whether it is putting an event together, it's like, I pour all my heart, my love into it, whether it's writing in a chapter for a book. I pour the love into it, whether it is speaking with um, someone on a podcast, I do it with so much love, like very intentional, whether it's communicating with another person, I'm doing it with love because that's really been my gift is to really be able to love though I may have been harmed. I may have been betrayed though. All those things may happen, right? All those things that happen to many of us, like, okay, you were betrayed, you were harmed, you were hit, you were, you were stolen from, you were, um, All those horrible things that can happen, yes, they've happened. They've happened to me, but releasing it with love, moving on with love, continue to have hope and love again, that's that's powerful. It just opens up a lot of doors that we may close because we're so wounded. So love for myself was the most powerful thing and self-forgiveness. So los dondes is learning how to work with this beautiful power of love and compassion and really tapping into the intuition that my grandmother had, that my mother has. I mean, they are so intuitive and so incredible and honoring myself and not doubting myself and now loving that part of myself. Cause before I would, I was, I was really scared of working with my intuition. Like I would find things out so seamlessly. I'm like, no, why, what is this happening? And then I would start doubting myself. And now the love and the intuition combined has helped me move into my, my new purpose and supporting others and community. It's been the most amazing experience to just grow into this place of self-love, self-recognition and love for the world, the universe, others, and honoring all those dundas of intuition and compassion and and moving towards these, these different phases, like the moon. Yes. Uh, I could sit here and listen to you and speak with you and share with you and share you with the world for a very long time. Um, but I want to, I got this I want to thank you for sharing so deeply, Erica Priscilla. E, where can people find you if they want to work with you and explore? Um, where do they go website wise? Where do they go Instagram wise? Absolutely. Anyone that's um, called to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram, Latinx, L-A-T-I-N-X, in social work, or Sandoval Collab, 
Instagram. I have a link tree with all of the links you can possibly need. Um, we just launched Soul Immersion Retreats and we're having um, pop-up retreats throughout the country, throughout New York, and they're filled with amazing collaboration with other incredible healers. And if you're called to come to one, we have them up there and I invite you and welcome you and hope to hear from you because a community that heals together is really unified and it's really beautiful. So thank you so much for having me. Mm, Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, gracias, gracias. I know you've all been touched by her story. I know that you're curious. Reach out, follow her, and let me know what you thought of this episode porque yo quiero saber. Thank you, everyone. Gracias, Erika Priscila. Mucho amor a todos. Gracias. Gracias. Mucho amor a ti, Vanessa.